Hello, my name is Anne Marie Cannon, and I'm the host of Armchair Historians. What's your favorite history? Each episode begins with this one question. Our guests come from all walks of life. YouTube celebrities, comedians, historians, even neighbors from the small mountain community that I live in. They're people who love history and get really excited about a particular time, place, or person from our distant or not so distant past. The jumping off point is the place where they became curious, then entered the rabbit hole into discovery. Fueled by an unrelenting need to know more, we look at history through the filter of other people's eyes. Armchair Historians is a Belgian Rabbit production. Stay up to date with us through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Wherever you listen to your podcast, that is where you'll find us. Armchair Historians is an independent, commercial-free podcast. If you'd like to support the show and keep it ad-free, you can buy us a cup of coffee through Ko-fi, or you can become a patron through Patreon. Links to both in the episode notes. Hello, fellow Armchair Historians. This episode is literally sickening. Today, I talked to Lindsay Valenti about how deadly it was to live during the Victorian era. From toxic shields green to ballerinas on fire, literally, find out some of the many ways the Victorians were hell-bent on destroying themselves. Lindsay Valente is the host of the Old Crime Podcast, where she and her sister Madison discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes that took place before the 1900s. She's also one of the co-hosts of Pineapple Pizza Podcast, which shares the myths, cryptids, and urban legends in different countries around the world. Before I roll the tape, I'd like to warn you that some of the topics we talk about you might find a little disturbing. Specifically, we do talk about death and being poisoned. Lindsay Valenti, welcome, and thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So as I was saying uh, before we started recording, I love true crime and I love history. So I get giddy when I think about your podcast. Thank you. And I really enjoy the banter between you and your sister. Yeah. Uh, Madison has a very infectious laugh. She does. Yes. I hear that quite often. That's one of the comments we get most often as people find our our laughter infectious. It is. Uh, it definitely is. So, yeah. but we'll, we're getting ahead of ourselves and we'll definitely talk about the old crime podcast after we talk about what's your favorite history that we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Uh, I thought in sticking with the theme of my podcast that my response would be very fitting in saying that I really enjoy the Victorian era, particularly because they unknowingly did so many things to kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they did. That is so true. I, I could think of a couple of things when you said that. So go on. Yeah. I'm, in. I'm invested. <laughs> okay. All right. One example is at the time there was a specific color of green called Shields Green or Paris Green that was extremely popular. It was used in wallpapers, paintings, fabrics, especially for dresses. It was a very sought after color. They'd use it on artificial flowers for hats. And they even used it in children's toys, which is horrifying. But it was made with copper and white arsenic <laughs> and potassium. I, I've heard of this before, but I didn't realize that that was the combination. Yeah. So as we know, arsenic is super poisonous. Sure. And so it's not really that surprising that people who wore these sorts of garments and stuff ended up having sores and damaged tissue, but they'd also get nauseous, get physically ill have constant headaches. And there are several reported stories of families who had the Shields Green wallpaper in their in their homes. And doctors were thinking maybe they had like tuberculosis because some of their symptoms were very similar. And he just told them to rest. Well, that's the worst thing they could do if they're trapped in this room 
surrounded by arsenic powder that they're just inhaling. And of course, they never thought, oh, maybe I should open a window or things like that. So there are all these reports of years later, we understand, oh, well, here you go. But um, at that time, you know, they didn't know any better. Like it was just, this was a very sought after color and it could only be achieved by combining these three things. So it's another, it's another one of those things. So when did uh, they figure it out? I think they started to kind of figure it out in the late 19th century, just because the color and sort of the fashion started to change a little bit. But I know there's a museum, and now I'm blanking on what the museum is called, but they do have a book that is kept in a specific case uh, that no one is allowed to touch, but it has samples of all of the wallpaper that was made with this color combination. I think someone described it as one of the most dangerous books in existence because you have to wear specific gloves. It's in like a sealed thing where you kind of have to like put your hands in the gloves to be able to handle it and things like that because it's it will kill you if you expose yourself to it. So do you know about when they stopped producing this color with all the poison? I'm asking because I'm think I used to uh, be in charge of the collections in a museum here in town. And there's this stunning green Victorian dress. And now I'm like thinking about all the times I handled it. And if it was (laughs) part of, (laughs) I'm serious. It's stunning too. I'll have to find it so I can Uh, post it for the episode and social media. The 19th century. So they eventually became obsolete. So it was the Shields green. And then there was a cobalt green which is also known as like zinc green, which wasn't as toxic as the Shields green, but it was still very toxic. And funnily enough, they ended up using that Shields green as an insecticide all the way up to the 1930s. So it's just one of those weird things where it's like, yeah. So that was one, that's that's just one thing that, you know, affected really everyone because it was such a popular color and it was the worst thing you could have possibly had on your person or in your home or around your children. So not only that, but clothes at that time were also extremely flammable. So you'd have, because in 1809, tool was invented and that became a big thing for ballerinas at the sure, time. Sure, yeah. And at that time, you know, they had lots of like the the tool, and so the ballerinas had to be very careful because at that time during performances, they used gas lights. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you got too close to one when you were performing on stage, you'd basically go up as if you were just covered in gasoline. And there are many reports of ballerinas who suffered horrific burns wearing. They were literally on fire. Skirts. They were literally on fire. (laughs) They were. Ugh. Uh, So, and in fact, cotton at the time was more flammable than like wool and silk. And a lot of it had to do with like the really big crinolines that the women would wear underneath their dresses to achieve that really like pretty much. (laughs) Yeah. So you're basically just walking or like a a walking kindling stick pretty much. Um, Uh. And they, as I was researching this, I stumbled upon this cloth that was called a, a flannet, which was basically cotton that was brushed to kind of resemble flannel. Okay. So they brushed it in a certain way and it was really popular as an option for like undergarments and night shirts, but it was also extremely flammable. And a lot of the incidents of it going into flames involved children wearing it. Ugh. So it's like this horrible thing that ended up spawning a product that they ended up labeling Non flam, <laughs> so, which sounds like the most kid friendly thing that you'd want to purchase. Oh, I want to make sure I get you the non flammable pajamas. So, 
it, it's just, it's crazy to think of the things that, you know, as the industrial revolution is continuing to unfold and things are starting to improve, all these things are happening and changing that, you know, it's almost like by trial and error and they don't realize at the time kind of just what they're doing as far as what they're exposing themselves to and well yeah because you're not even thinking about it you're totally oblivious and instead you're thinking that they're thinking oh we have this great new thing it's so wonderful oh it's so vivid that green that the last mm -hmm. thing you're thinking of is it's going to poison and kill people yep yeah and it's just it's just not something that you would have ever thought of when you go out to the store and you purchase this beautiful dress. Right. I think we're more aware of it now, but I think back at like the pajamas that I used to wear when I was a kid coming down <laughs> at Christmas, like the, the videos, the film we have, cause it was a long time ago, but um, <clears throat> yeah. So we didn't know I could have just mm -hmm. gone up and smoke. Yeah. I mean, this isn't like a new thing. Like there are things that were still popular in the 80s and 90s that were almost just as bad yeah. as far as flammability is concerned. Yeah. So, well, you know what I think of today that is maybe the closest to that is because we don't really know too much about it is what they I can't think of the name of it, what they use for smoking. The vaping? Yeah, vaping. Yep. So that was supposed to be that was invented by these college grad students or something. And it was supposed to be a way for people to be healthier and get off the nicotine. But it turns out that it's starting to have all kinds of repercussions, right? Yeah, because it's got just, I mean, at the end of the day, you're still inhaling something into your lungs. Right, right. So we are, and st it's, and it we are still doing this shit. <laughs> yep, yep. We are still doing it. Yeah. But it's not just dresses and stuff like there's you know hats were a very big thing back in the victorian era for women and men and i didn't really realize until i was looking into it a little bit more but women used to have like actual dead birds on their hats oh because it was fashionable to have this like bird figurine with like fake flowers and stuff on your hats and in order to preserve these animals is like the taxidermists of the time would use like arsenic lace soaps. So again, you're putting arsenic on your head, you know, for the sake of fashion. And I don't know that I would particularly want to have a dead animal on my head, but that's just me, you know? So, but it was kind of the same thing with men's hats because the top hats were extremely fashionable and, um, they were typically made with beaver pelt, you know, and that to get the right feel for the fur and stuff, they used mercury oh, to geez. process it because that's what gave it its really smooth and glossy texture. And so when you think about, you know, like Alice in Wonderland and Lewis Carroll's Mad Hatter, Yes. A lot of that had to do with the fact that people would act like that when they had mercury poisoning. Like it was known to cause convulsions and trembling, abdominal cramps, uh. wacky speech, because, you know, it's on your head. So it's seeping into oh, your head. Geez, yeah. Not to mention if you were an actual milliner and you were making these hats you'd have it on your hands you'd be in you'd be inhaling the fumes from it so that's kind of where that mad hatter concept comes from is from how they would be handling this mercury to make these hats oh my goodness okay this is really disturbing i'm glad i wasn't born during the victorian era even though <laughs> right. i love the stories in the victorian era but ugh. i know it's it's one of those things where you know, you, you read all these stories and there's so many aspects of Victorian, you know, like England and other areas in the Victorian era that are so fascinating. But then there's this this part of it that you don't really realize or really think about because it doesn't come up very often. You know, like it's not something that just 
they call out like, oh, by the way, do you realize how dangerous the Victorian era was? <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> and, you know, not to mention how awful corsets were. I mean, we know oh, why? how why, awful those why are. Why would they ever do that to themselves? I don't know. Ah. Yeah. Like, don't even get me started. <laughs> That's just. I wonder what they'd think if they could see the future and and see us like the way we dress and all that. Yeah. And like our our definition of beauty standards now yeah. as opposed to then. And the, the most interesting thing to me is that the hourglass shape was such a big deal for them. Like you had to have this like very narrow waist. But then they would spend all this time making this really large, like, bustle in the back. So it was like you could hardly move because the skirts were so big. And that was another thing that was hard for women because there'd be times when if they weren't careful wearing these giant skirts, they'd trip and fall down the stairs. And they could end up, like, severely injuring themselves, if not dying from yeah. falling down the stairs, wearing these giant skirts yes. because... That's what was expected. Or, you know, you'd hear stories of them falling out of coaches because they couldn't step out of the coaches. <laughs> um, and I and I remember when I was researching the wig snatching episode that I did with Madison on Yeo Crime, along with that, along with having this giant skirt that you're wrestling with, there were many coaches that were, if you were rich enough were sort of repurposed so that you would be kneeling on the floor because your wig was so tall that you would need the space for your not only your wig but also your skirt <laughs> so you couldn't even sit when you're re when you're riding in these coaches because it was just it was making all this uh, room for your hair and your skirt my knees which, are hurting just thinking about it I know. <laughs> and it's and it's it's not it's not like they went very quickly anywhere. So I can only imagine how long you would be kneeling in this coach to go to a party. Like how uncomfortable would you be? Ew. And I doubt you would sit when you got there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like how would you sit? <laughs> I don't know. I can't imagine. Isn't that what those fainting chairs were for so that you could <laughs> lay down yes. like in the ladies' lounge or something. <laughs> yeah, like the chase lounge where you kind of like just kind of slump over because you can't necessarily sit. I imagine it would be much easier to get up that way than trying to. I don't know. How would you even get up in those skirts? I can't even imagine it. I don't know. But it's I just... think that it was a way to keep. I mean, of course, we're talking about people of means that were doing all these crazy things and mm -hmm. in a way i think it was just another way to hold a woman down true and i mean yeah. obviously we were complicit in it because we had to have the newest nicest things mm -hmm. yeah speaking of beauty standards unrealistic beauty standards Obviously, cosmetics were a huge thing, and there were these cosmetics that both men and women would wear that were like, it was like this white powder, and it was really popular starting all the way in the 17th century up to like the 19th century, and one of the most popular products was called Laird's Bloom of Youth, because it was supposed to give you this like glowing white complexion. Well, it had lead in it. Oh, jeez. Well, yeah, it's and... like the clowns, they use the lead white face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it said that part of the reason it started becoming so popular is because people of means would use it to cover up smallpox scars. Oh. After the, um, after the epidemic would come through. But... You know, using this product would cause, you know, eye inflammation. It could cause your teeth to rot, baldness, and the skin after a while starts to darken because it's absorbing this these chemicals. And so you'd have to put even more powder on to try uh. to 
cover up the darkening skin. Yeah. So it was like this never ending cycle of putting more and more of this. Didn't anybody, thing on your face. I mean, because that's a long time. It starts in, you're saying the 1700s and it goes on. Didn't anybody ever make this connection? I think there had to have been some sort of connection, but I'm sure there were some people who were like, well, it's it's worth it because I don't want people to see all these horrible scars on my face or it's fine if I only use it when I'm going out to court or whatever. Yeah. It's, you know, I don't need to wear it when I'm in my private chambers or I mean with arsenic. Arsenic was something that was used in tons and tons of things all the way up into the 19th century. One thing that I thought was very interesting is, you know, how having dilated pupils means that you are infatuated with somebody. Like if you look at somebody and your pupils are very large, that means you're infatuated with somebody. In order to dilate their pupils so they would have that like wide-eyed look about about them to be very seductive, women would put deadly nightshade, deadly nightshade in their eyes. Uh, oh my word. Which we know can cause headaches and blurry vision and vertigo, but we still use a very diluted alternative to it when you go to the eye doctor, you know, when they dilate your pupils and stuff. Oh, okay. So we don't put nightshade in our eyes anymore, but we use something similar when you go to the eye doctor, when they give you the drops. Oh, and okay, yeah. It has the same kind of effect, but it's a lot less poisonous this time around. <laughs> So were all these things related to fashion and our vanity? A lot of them were. A lot of them were just ways to imp like improve your complexion. So one of the standards of beauty at that time, along with the, you know, the white complexion, it was the very pale complexion because the paler you were, the higher of status you were because if you worked out in the fields or if you worked outside, you'd have much darker skin. So having extremely pale skin was very desirable at that time. So women would use arsenic to make their skin lighter. Arsenic spring baths were a big thing among the elite as you would go to a special bath and bathe in arsenic. Um, Arsenic wafers were also a thing where you would have these special crackers you could eat that had arsenic in them that were supposed to make you look younger and more attractive. Well, what was the, to the labels that it did? What it, Did it literally lighten your skin up? It thinned out the skin enough where it would lighten up. Oh. So it would thin out your skin. And it also, if you used it on your face, it would give you like this rosy complexion which was, and actually along with that, it it gave you very similar looks to when you had tuberculosis. So you would have the pale skin, your lips would be very red, your cheeks would be very rosy. And I even read reports that there were women who would purposefully expose themselves to tuberculosis oh, geez. in the hopes of achieving this look, which I'm just like, why would you do that? Why? But... You know, if vanity is so powerful, it's such a crazy thing to me, like in reading about these things that women would do just to make themselves more appealing and more desirable. It's it's both shocking and extremely sad mm -hmm. that they would go to such extremes and expose themselves to such horrible things because you know arsenic is no joke you eat that and that does horrible things to your body and same thing with mercury i mean it's not just women i mean with the men having mercury and mercury and lead were in eye paints at the time so you'd have that so they would paint that on their eyes for their you know eye shadows and stuff which would could cause kidney disease and they also mix it with antimony oxide, which is a carcinogen. Oh, wow. So it has, you know, that sort of effect. And 
arsenic was labeled as a bunch of different things at the time. Like they used it in, you know, like tonics and things of that time. And because it was also it could be used as a pesticide, you could purchase it at the pharmacy. So you could just go to the drugstore and purchase arsenic. That's one of the most popular tools of poisoners at, in the day um, because you could just go to the yeah. drugstore and buy it. Oh, sure. Okay. Because because you could say, oh, I'm, I have a rat problem. I, so I need to buy this amount of arsenic so I can take care of my rat problem. Okay. So it wasn't just women that used it, but apparently there was a belief that it had the same properties as Viagra in men. So men would take it thinking that it was going to help them in the bedroom. I don't know how effective it was, <laughs> that was but that was I would imagine it's not very effective. <laughs> Oh my god. I would assume it didn't do anything, but that's just me. Um you know, and there's some crazy things that they would use for like their red lip paint. Very popular red lip polish color at the time was made from of carmine from crushed insects. So it was a pigment that they would get from crushing a certain insect. I think it was kind of like a ladybug. And they would mix ammonia into it as they were killing these bugs. They, they used the ammonia as a way to, like, kill the bugs. And I don't know why they would think, oh, because it's killing the bugs. It's, a, it's safe to put in my mouth, you know, like it's safe to put right? on my face. Right. But, you know, again, going to that whole unrealistic beauty standard thing of, you know, well, it's pretty. It makes me look pretty. So I'm sure it's fine trying to think of what some other ones were oh this one was really good about teeth so you know how much dental hygiene was such a big deal in the victorian era wink wink nudge <laughs> nudge so apparently if you were to mix a teaspoon of ammonia in a glass of water and swallow it it was supposed to improve your breath and prevent tooth decay if you had acid reflux and <laughs> For toothpaste, you could just use charcoal twice a day to brush your teeth. Charcoal? Yeah. So they would use, like, burned bread to, <laughs> to brush their teeth. Did it really I'm work? Like, well, I, I mean, I've heard of charcoal for uh, combating certain kinds of poison, so it might have helped with combating the shit that they were putting in their bodies. Right. So maybe it was helpful in that respect. <laughs> it was just... It was helping with the ammonia they had just ingested, but they said uh, a common remedy if you had a tooth that was starting to decay was to use a mouthwash that had brandy, which, all right, okay. myrrh, and camphor. Well, camphor is extremely poisonous, so if you swallow that, you're you're probably going to die. But, you know, as long as you rinse it, it's probably fine, you know, so... It's just the weirdest things. And so curling irons were also a thing. They were starting to use curling irons more because the wigs weren't as in fashion anymore in the Victorian era, or they were starting to go out of fashion. So they didn't have the fake curls anymore that would be attached to the wigs. So they wanted to, they'd have to curl their own hair. And early curling irons had to be heated up on a fire, obviously. So if you put it in your hair too quickly, you could literally burn your hair off because the iron's so hot. Ugh. So that was something you had to be very careful of when... Those crazy Victorians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, goodness gracious. And I think the last one I'll share with you, which... Is just kind of also a little bit horrifying. But apparently, along with the pale complexion, is you didn't want to have any body hair on your arms and stuff when you, if you were a woman of means, you know, as because it'd be ghastly to have hair on your arms when you're dancing with your suitor or, or whatever. So, to get to remove the hair and also have the added benefit of whitening your arms, you would use chloride of lime, which. Oh my God they would use to bleach cotton. 
And then you would use a vinegar rinse afterwards to get the rest of it off. Um, but that also kind of eats away at your skin. Yeah, don't so you they... kind of have to. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of a murder in uh, the town that I was living in in Ohio. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. The... Oh, what was the name of it? It's escaping me, but they buried the bodies of a family and they put lime on it. So I always, yep. so when I think of lime, I think that's not a safe thing around nope. flesh. <laughs> nope. Cause it's, it eats away at it. That's the whole thing. So Ugh. again, like there's just so many things that they did all in the name of beauty that today, just thinking about it is horrifying but it's also a bit fascinating to read about and just kind of see to what extremes people were willing to go just for the sake of either being fashionable or for finding somebody to love, you know? So it's it's both fascinating and extremely sad. But that's one of the things that I find so fascinating about the Victorian era is there's just so many things that that came into vogue without them really realizing just how harmful they were in the long run. Well, and it makes, it's making me think about fads in general Mm -hmm. and how, I mean, the, um, the things that we do kind of like a knee jerk reaction so that we can be in, we think it's a good idea. And then we find out later, like the vaping, like, mm-hmm. oh, this is good. We can we can vape and it's it'll be healthy healthier for us, but it's really not. It's not. Mm-hmm. Well, think about how fashionable tanning beds were for so long. I went to tanning and how bed. bad I did. and how bad that was for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's something that was really popular for a really long time. And how people really wanted to achieve that really dark tan. And I know it's a lot it's improved a lot since it first came about, since it first became a thing that you would go to, but do people still do that? There are still some places where you can go and do like the traditional tanning in a tanning bed, but most, I think a lot of places now do the spray tan, which that also kind of freaks me out. I'm, I'm pale as a, as a ghost and I'm, I've learned to live with it and accept it. (laughs) Yeah. I do try to be more careful than I ever was before. But back in the Victorian era, you would be considered higher class. There we go. All that book reading and sitting inside and not playing outside would have done me very well in the Victorian era. (laughs) That's right. You love books. I read that today. So is that it for the story time? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about what you do and how I found you. So I am one of the hosts of the Yield Crime podcast, and it's a podcast that I run with my younger sister, Madison, where we cover cases that take place before the 1900s. So a lot of the cases we cover are crimes that involve poisoners, a lot of strange murders. We do go into some cannibals, not a lot, but some. I tend to look for stories that are less well-known and kind of obscure. A lot of them are ones that you don't really hear about on other true crime shows. You may hear them mentioned here and there, but overall they're not something you would hear on one of your more popular true crime shows. And it's just a lot of fun to find these stories and find these cases and really dive into the people of the time, what they did. And so much of it is the same. The same in the sense that we're not that different from how we were way back when. (laughs) Like we like to think that we have improved a whole lot over the past hundreds of years, thousands of years. But people were still committing really dumb crimes back in the 1700s, just like how there are people today that still commit very dumb crimes. And 
it's fascinating to learn about these people and the things that they did and bring them back to light. Because one of the things, I think one of the best compliments that I ever get on the show is when someone tells me they, they walked away learning something new about history that they never heard of before. Mm-hmm. And I honestly can say that for every single episode that I've written, and right now we're sitting at 70 episodes as of the time that we're having, we're conducting this interview together, I learn something new each time I write an episode because I may think I know the story Mm -hmm. because there are some stories where I will know kind of before I start researching a little bit about the case. Sure. But I go away learning so much more about these people or whatever the event was. And it's just fascinating, like some of the things that you learn in history. One of the fav- my favorite people that we've covered on the show is Xing Shi, who was this uh, pirate queen in China. And you don't hear about her, but she was one of the most successful pirates of all time. She had this huge fleet of pirate ships, and she protected herself against the British. Like that's almost an unknown thing at that time, you know, if you consider the naval power of the British. Was that a recent and episode? That was one of my early early okay. ones. I think that was episode nine. She was just awesome. And she at a time when being a female and being and leading a bunch of men, especially in a pirate profession, was unheard of. And she was this total badass who went from being, went from working in a brothel to having a fleet of hundreds of pirate ships. And then she ended up leaving it to her husband. And then she just, owned, she became a madam at another brothel until she passed because wow. that was something that she was like, I don't need the, I don't need the power anymore. Like I did it. That's like, I did it. I don't need to do it anymore. But it's characters like that that you discover that are just fascinating because you think to yourself as you're hearing about them or you're reading about them, why don't more people know about Mm -hmm. these people? Yeah. You know, like, why isn't this something that's... Because they've been erased. They've been erased from the history. They're not held to, you know, like a Genghis Khan. They're not held to that esteem because it's Mm -hmm. a woman. We know why. We know why. We know why. I know. And that's one thing that I really want to try and make sure when I find these female characters that did some really cool things, if it fits within the context of the show, Mm. I want to bring them to light. Mm. Like Anne Lister was another character. That one. And that was fascinating. Fame lately because. Of their, was it Netflix or Amazon? Yeah, I can't remember which one it was. But yeah, it was like, maybe it was BBC. One network had a show on her. I can't remember which one it was. but And she didn't commit any crimes. She just happened to be a lesbian at a time when being a lesbian was unheard of. And her story is fascinating. And the fact that she had this coded language that she would use in her diaries to document her illicit affairs with other women is both hilarious and fascinating. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there there are so many people in history that you're never going to read about in a history book. Mm-hmm. They're, they, they weren't part of a, a great battle, a great military battle. They weren't part of a clever, well-known coup to a government downfall or anything. They're just these tiny little char- background characters that still have a lot to offer as far as historical context is concerned. Yes, yes, so, I agree. Uh, and that's what I look for in my guests is trying to find people that um, one of my favorite uh, episodes was when I interviewed the a married couple. They wrote the book, um, Loving a Photographic History of Men in Love, 1859 to 1959. And that was, you know, such an amazing, it's a, it's an erased, it's a hidden history. And yet yep. they, they've collected these photographs that they would find because they love to go to um, flea markets and things like that. Oh yeah, they, for sure. 
you know, and there was, there's a lot of history in that, you know, visual media that, you know, I think, and one of the reasons I like your show is because I know that we align with what, because you, you say the snarky comments that I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I have no problems being snarky on my show, that's for sure. <laughs> so I like to bring, you know, I think there is a movement for history to be accessible to people. Somebody in my mm -hmm. Twitter feed uh, wrote something today about they got an email from somebody who said that their history is too casual. And it's like, really? Yeah, that's a gatekeeper mentality. And it is. And it's like, no, it's not. It's it's inspiration. It's, you know, it's education, things to learn, hopefully, and carry forward with the message of, you know, what happened in the past. And hopefully we don't repeat it, although we're kind of stupid and we do. Yeah, that's one of the one of the many great and awful things about humanity is we have a tendency to repeat things, whether they're good or bad. So um, the goal is always to repeat the good things and not, yeah. and learn from the mistakes. Right. But, and hold people um, up to, you know, the light that haven't had the exposure that maybe they deserved. And I love that you do that. You do that. You guys do that. And it seems like... <clears throat> Madison is the Ed McMahon to your Johnny. She is. <laughs> uh, the great thing about this show is for people who are unfamiliar with the format. So I do all the research and the writing for the episodes. And then I'm essentially telling Maddie a story. So all of the her reactions are genuine in real time because she's never heard the story before. So whatever I'm sharing with her, it's fresh for her. And... There are, there have been a few episodes where she's had a kind of an idea of what we're going to be talking about, but I will still, I'm still able to kind of surprise her with some things that she didn't know or things that she thought she knew, but they're actually a little bit different. And one thing I really enjoyed when we did the Elizabeth Battery episode or Elizabeth Bathory, as she is most commonly referred to, is being able to go through her history and really be like, there's no way she could have done what people were accusing her of doing. And the reason these tales were being spun about her is because she owned quite a bit of land as a woman during a time when powerful men wanted what she had mm -hmm. in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And by spinning these tales and discrediting her, they were able to get what they wanted from her. Again, vilifying the woman for, you know, doing what she was doing and spinning her in a light so that unless you really dig into it, you view her as this horrible villain that's done all these horrible things when in reality, there's no real evidence that she was ever abusive to any of the people who worked for her, things of that nature. So that's another thing I enjoy about these deep dives into these people is because so much of what we are taught can be wrong. Like there are, there are certain things, certain spins we like to put on things. We like to take our, our viewpoint of certain things and like, put our values and things on other cultures so it fits within our lens or our view or understanding of things. And it's nice to be able to take that filter off and to try to view history and peoples in the way they should be viewed instead of by putting our values, values on them, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but I don't know. I think a lot of history is fiction, even I don't know the way that I see it. It's fiction. It's based on my values mm -hmm. and my perceptions and my desires. And I think that it just helps to look at it through a bunch of different lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think about that uh, play. It's not the wizard of Oz, but it's uh, the one about the witch. Wicked. Wicked. Thank you. That's a really good play, by the way. Oh, I have seen it. It's very good. I saw it in London. It was quite amazing. 
Um, oh, I bet. But I, it's that idea. It's like, really? Who was she? Oh, this yeah. is a completely different perspective. And I know it's, yep. it is fiction. It's all fiction. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of, I keep thinking about that as we're having this conversation. Yeah, like there are, there are certain characters in history that, to an extent, have become characters because their story has been so warped by time or the things that are documented about them are village gossip or it's fanciful tellings of the time based on what era in history it was and how the reporting was done. So you you end up getting these people who have these like tall tale-esque stories right. written about them, whereas once you peel back the layers, they might not actually be nearly as fascinating as they're painted out to be. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they're more fascinating than they were painted out to be, depending on who the t- what the telling is and who the character is. So it's that's one thing I love about history, is that there are, depending on who's telling the tale mm-hmm. and what source you use when you're researching, there are certain people who can be seen a number of ways, depending on who is telling the story. And I love discovering these hidden figures that aren't your famous everyday people and being able to share their stories with other people who may not know about them, who may have heard of them, but don't really know a whole lot about them. And I guess at the end of the day, my hope is that I do a fairly decent job sharing their story oh, since I think they you can't do. share it themselves. I think you do. I like the banter, but I also like that there's not too much banter because there's some really popular podcasts that they spend the first half hour in banter. And I hate that. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. I feel like you have just enough and it breaks up the, the tension because a lot of the mm-hmm. stories that you tell have, you know, tension mm-hmm. or is innate in the stories. So um, I think you do a marvelous job and I've added you to my queue. And (laughs) thank you. Why did you choose this history? I think I kind of chose it because given the nature of what I do for the podcast, you know, obviously it's something that I, I have a vested interest in because it gives me content, but it's also interesting to read about and hear about the people of the time and learn a little bit more about kind of their motivations as far as what they were looking for as far as beauty standards and things like in popularity and things like that. One common thread that I've discovered when whenever we typically when we cover a story that takes place in the Victorian era, as I mentioned before, is like how prolific arsenic poisoning was. Yeah. Because it was so easy to get. You know, that's a really good point. Yeah. Like that was, it was such a prolific thing because it was so readily accessible. And at the end of the day, the motivation for so many of these women that would poison their husbands or poison neighbors or things was for money, monetary gain, which again shows you that it's all about putting ourselves at a higher level than we are currently at or achieving a certain standard, achieving a a certain status. And it's like there are cases like like Mary Ann Cotton, who I think she poisoned two or three husbands, something like that, but made sure that she she got the insurance money so that she could, you know, get more things and become more popular and marry up in the world and... There are other women that did similar things that were basically like family annihilators in order to get more money. And it's interesting learning about these people and what sort of desperate circumstances they felt they were in, Mm. in order to commit the acts that they did Mm. in, in order to gain 
something from it, whether that's money or status or even sympathy, you know, because there were some people who, you know, we think of Munchausen's by proxy as a, as a fairly recent thing, but it was still popular I'm sure back it was then. when you think about it, because like you said, we go back to what you said is that we really haven't changed much. Like we're still we doing haven't. the same shit. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there were so many stories and I can't, it's bothering me that I can't remember who it was because I've covered so many female poisoners on the show. <laughs> But there was one woman who had a lot of children, and she would would do that, where she would slowly poison them to gain sympathy from friends and neighbors and things. And, you know, it wasn't until much later that they kind of realized she's killing them all. Yeah. Like, she poisoned all of them, you know. And a lot of the times they would get away with it because the symptoms were similar to you could write it off as tuberculosis yeah. or you could write it off as like scarlet fever or some other disease that was common at the time based off the symptoms. And so in that respect, I think it was much easier to get away with murder sure. back then because the science wasn't there to be able to determine what was actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and tell us where we can find you again. Sure. Um, so we're Yield Crime Podcast. You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter. We have at Yield Crime Pod. We're on Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. We have a YouTube channel, which is basically just audiograms of our episodes. If you like I to do the same thing. listen on YouTube. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, those are the most popular places you can find us. We're pretty much on every podcast platform you can think of. So wherever you are listening to this podcast, you can probably find Deal Crime. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed hearing your s horrible stories. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, is she going to regret asking me to be no, on the show never. because of all the horrible things I talked I about? True, I love true crime. I told you, and history. So, this was great. Thank you so much, and I look for you on Twitter. Sounds great. Thank you very much for having me. This was really fun. Oh, good. Okay. There you have it, Lindsay Valenti, host of Ye Old Crime Podcast, talking about those crazy Victorians. Be sure to check out our episode notes to find out more about Lindsay and both of her podcasts, as well as the topic discussed today. Also, I'd like to take a moment to remind you of some of the ways you can support the show that won't cost you a thing other than your time. First, you can follow us on social media, including Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Once you're following us, join in on the conversation. Also, it really helps when you rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts that have reviews. And that's it. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.